goals wrong. I know. That's what we're going to cover today. <laughs> we're not quite there yet because today we are in my home, Luke's in town, yeah. San Antonio, Texas. And we're, we had some show to cover today with some clients and it is our Halloween themed podcast. If you're watching at home, if you're not and you're listening, <laughs> Renee has her skull on our table and that's our, uh, our center talking piece, <laughs> which is appropriate, right? For the contest prep discussion. Yeah. Contest prep, getting that Skeletor diet face. Hopefully you don't have a spider crawling out of it, like the skull on the table, but if you take too much orals, <laughs> you might. Yeah. So we, we will dive into oral use deployment misapplication these last weeks of contest prep that's our discussion for the day yeah i think uh a lot of it too is just going to be kind of around like an understanding of like the objective decision making around why we're using these compounds too and just making sure that logic's there but to start like you had a good weekend pro debut for ashley yeah at uh figure pro ashley lakamowski which uh, it's it's been a cool one with her because mm. It, sometimes it's hard to have clients where you come up from like the very beginning. So like I wasn't there for Ashley's first show, but still like from the amateur level to winning a show, winning an overall to winning, getting her pro card nationals, the overall at nationals now to making her pro debut. So uh, to see that process and along the way of growth of us both as like coach and athlete is, is really rewarding. And if she got on stage with a great lineup, some Olympians there and Got a got a fifth place finish to a top five at your pro debut. Yeah, which uh, there's already a lot of lot of lot of room to like further move up from there for a pro debut. You're not you're not starting at the back of the pack, you know. Right, and so that's like that that further progression from there is just exciting because like what's capable is pretty high. And like you know, kudos to her because a lot of people want to make the choice to like quickly jump onto stage like right when they turn pro. Mm. Her thing's always been like I want to just be knockout undeniable every time I get on stage. So like when we came to nationals, we wanted absolute, I'm um, knockout pro. Yeah. Um, and it was like overall win for this pro show. Like we, she took time almost a year and a half to grow and improve. Then you just kind of see where you're at, but it was, it was a great like first outing. Now it's like, Hey, let me back down and see, uh, what it takes now to be undeniable yeah. to win a pro show. And getting and getting to watch her pose in person, like there's definitely undeniable characteristics and some shots already, right? And it's yeah. just like kind of filling the holes in a couple others. It's a very impressive progression because like just, I remember like when she was trying to qualify for nationals and like all yeah. that, so. So yeah, fun weekend, so rewarding, exhausting, running around being like the backstage mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me yesterday too. Yeah, good weekend for you. Yeah, overall win for uh, Shannon Delahanty. Um, she's a wellness competitor. Um, we actually weren't supposed to do this show. Um, she got ready like probably five or six weeks ahead of schedule. And I was like, look, like, let's not prolong this. Like, let's just go get our qualification. We've got to do nationals later in the yeah. year. We can come out of this and do a little bit of a diet break and kind of give you that opportunity to kind of take a step back. So, um, yeah, she, she kind of had like three or four weeks where the progress on a week to week basis was just really rapid and unexpected. And it was, uh, pretty impressive almost to the point where we pushed her to North Americans, but yeah, it was a good weekend. She, she stood out on stage, which at a regional show you should, like if you're going to go do a national show is like you walk out, you're that level of physique where it's kind of eyes immediately drawn. So just excited to see it. It'll be her first national show. So, so what, what's next from, from there? We'll do a diet rate kind of first two weeks post show. Um, and then just diet into nationals and finish it out. We yeah. weren't supposed to compete for another four or five weeks. Right. So the time block between the original first show and nationals was a lot shorter, but yeah, it'll, it'll be pull her back up. I think, um, we've got some posing work to do just from a presentation standpoint, just to kind of polish it. But Man, from a physique standpoint, it's going to be really cool to see because she... It's the rare thing to be ready early. Yeah. It, better spot. like So nice. It's so much less stress. Like, she was even saying, like... Because I picked her up last year, like, mid-prep. I was like... She was, like, 12 weeks out of her, her show. She left another coach, came to me. I finished out the prep. We won her first overall in the NPC. And it was just, like, a good look. But, like, I didn't get a full prep with her. Mm -hmm. And so this time, it was, like... The prep transition process happened. We had a really productive first four weeks of prep. And it's like, I was really able to see her change at the rate she's capable of. And I kind of build that extra wiggle room time in there, which is why the first show is a little, little bit later. 
and it just kind of all happened like no bumps no nothing it just so smoothly happened so um kudos to her she works her ass off like she uh, anything i ask her to do she's done it and it's literally been a perfect prep so that helps right so uh, i think she's going to be in the mix um at nationals i think she's got some qualities that are very standout-ish um it's just how you compare it to a lineup like that because it's like you're with the the big dogs at that point yeah, it's stuff at, at nationals you get you do get winners from all the shows around, but again, like what we saw at the San Antonio amateur show, right? It's just the pool is kind of dwindling down for lo- your local shows and number of people. So even at nationals, you still get kind of a diverse lineup. Yeah, very much so. Um, so it's like, how do you, how do you fare in that lineup with those judges? You know, because national nationals, you're like you have some knockout nationals where like everyone that shows up, you're like, wow, these are like all high level, and sometimes it's like real apples and oranges so. yeah so uh, we'll, see. we'll see it's our first national show i'm excited for it i think if the posing portion gets polished a bit it'll be a very good showing right on so excited for it well like being backstage and talking with competitors and even in the j3u forum like we're still getting more pop-up relative to our conversation on orals peaking and prep or deployment of or- orals and uh, a lot of this is just misapplication and, and a lot of times early use of them I think yeah. this is kind of like the main issue that we do see in their missing of the rationale of, of when to use them mm. and I think it's just from the past there's just been a uh, kind of bro lure around at X weeks this oral goes in yeah at X weeks even the, even for injectables as, as well mm-hmm. um, and usually it's always at least you know, from, from where I came, it was like, you know, eight weeks out, Annabelle goes in, like five weeks out, Winstrel goes in, yeah. three weeks out, Halo yeah, testing is. goes in. And, and then all of a sudden you have like your three, four orals deep and you're like, what's working? I'm like, I don't know. Obviously like all of it's doing something. Then you end up with prep after prep. We're like, well, that worked last time. So I'm not going to change the thing. <laughs> and you have this continuation of like just every oral in place. So, yeah. um, I, I see this still. So we have people that, that come in the forums, um, or that come up to shows or, or we see, see plans and they're already on this oral. Yeah. And it's like, why is that there? It's like, I the, don't know. The, I don't know. It's just like, just the, that's just when you put it in. Yeah. And I think a lot of times too, the, something I've noticed even nowadays is the duration portion is not quite as discussed about. So these things are going in even earlier. Like I've had some people come to me like 12, 13, 14 weeks out with already some morals in place or for show. Yeah. Then you have two second show, third show. And it's like, now you're, you're on like 18, 19 weeks. If you're doing multiple shows like that. I guess that's uh well, so what? Like why? Yeah. That what, that, right. Like what's, what's the problem with that Luke? Yeah. So <laughs> from like a health perspective, especially <laughs> depending on the oral usage, like uh, most of the time we're going to be looking at like liver toxic compounds, especially yeah. if we're looking at like wind straw and halo. Um, and just overall like managing those health metrics within a prep, in my opinion, is part of optimizing the progress over the duration of that prep and only deploying when the value of these compounds is actually warranted. Right. Because, um, I like to think of it as like a apple tree. So like take the lowest hanging fruit, right? Like take what's on the table for you to continue to progress. And when we talk about like 15 weeks out, 14 weeks out, 13 weeks out, there's like so much there that can be used in order to progress from a fat loss perspective. And then the question's like, why is the orals being deployed for a fat loss purpose in the first place? When we know that from a mechanistic standpoint, that's not going to be the primary primary action and so it's like a, a misunderstanding of like well I can go ahead and start getting a little bit harder if I deploy XYZ yeah yeah so it's and along the lines of those health metrics it's like you know absolutely I'm I will take risk it's not mm. you know risk avoidance whatsoever it's trying to reduce it but again like you have someone like I've done preps that are 35 weeks long you know two shows three shows they add up to where if you have orals in the whole time, you're spending majority of the year with a, a pretty poor lipid panel. Because even for like five milligrams of Anivar on a female, like I'll see their HDL levels cut in half. And not that HDL is a sole marker for us, but regardless, when you have everything else 
polypharmacy packed on top of it for the majority of the year, year after year, this is what could lead up to like poor health outcomes. So it's like, could we do this another way that has the same aspect that we're trying to pull out when that oral was going in? And then you're asking, well, why was the oral put in to begin with? And that's when we <laughs> see the the lack of knowledge with, within that. So mechanistically, like you said, our main role of when we're adding in any anabolic steroid is primarily muscle retention. Yep, absolutely. Primary mechanism working on the angina receptor to hold on to muscle. Um, of course, you, you you know it's also building muscle as well. It's an anabolism and anti-catabolism at the same time. Um, and then it, it it's a it does have an influence on body fat, but it's not our main primary tool. Yeah. Um, and so when we see people that are adding in them for hardening agents, right? That's stuff. It's so how does that mechanism work? And that's why I go to the whys, right? So, yeah. you know, and we know like they're not necessarily hardeners. Don't ever call mm. any worlds hardeners because I think that's what convolutes when you should be using them. Yep. It's yep. like, Hey, these are, our muscle retention agents. Okay, that makes more sense. When are we gonna have times when we need to deploy them for muscle retention? Yep, and I think one of the benefits too is like, when we look at kind of like the acute versus the long-term, like the acute setting of detriment with an oral relative to the acute setting of using other in anabolics in order to create that tissue retention, like the acute detriment and health is not there with these injectables at the same rate that we're gonna see with these orals. And a lot of times we're just using DHT derivative based orals, especially when we're like deploying Winstraw and stuff like that, where we could use a DHT derivative to see those, you know, influences on the ER and stuff like that for like est potential estrogen management without really needing to implement an oral in that case and have that tissue retention property there, whether it be male or female, right? And, yeah. and having that longer duration anabolics use be with a compound that's going to overall be less detrimental to the health metrics over the long term yeah where we see that oral usage kind of come into play is like that acute performance retention which is now where we kind of see the value in the orals for the back of the prep right so so 12 weeks out the rationale should be like uh, around some type of assessment of do you require more input for androgens and what, is, what does that look like? Well, if they're muscle retention agents, where are we gonna be able to better assess muscle retention? Mm. And gym performance is a primary one, right? So if you're constantly seeing across the prep, like gym performance is going down, this would be the assessment for looking at all your variables. And usually it's a lot of other variables outside of like, hey, time for more drug. It's usually like, what is your recovery tools, your sleep, what's nutrition at? What's your stress management at? Then also looking at your overall training volume because that might need to make the adjustment. And if you're nailing everything, a training's appropriate and it's just, hey, it is what it is. Like we're in a state of accumulating fatigue and gym performance is gonna be going down potentially. And there's a rationale to increase androgen load for what its job is, is to hold on to tissue. So Luke, you're saying 12 weeks out, that's plenty of time to put in an injectable. So rather than we put in, a lot of times it's 20 milligrams of Anivar, 50 milligrams of Anivar across the week, that's 150 to 350 milligram of total androgen. Instead, put that in as Masteron or Primabolin or mm. whichever other is your main anabolism or muscle retention injectable that you're using. That's an application. Yeah, Right. absolutely. So, and then so the next rationale is, well, when is, when is the oral to be deployed? And that's in that acute performance right. setting, right? That pre-workout deployment of the, the anabolics or the, the oral anabolics with the, the, the goal of improving the, the session that's right there in front of you. And especially when we have the shorter timetable, like you said, like the time to make a difference within sure. the deployment of a compound, um, we're going to see that lead to the performance retention within the session that's going to allow for the muscle retentive properties that we're actually using these anabolics for because at that point like five six weeks out pretty much the baseline of compound usage is fully in play when we talk about like an injectables and they're probably not changing a whole lot from that point on mm -hmm. and so the deployment from here is like 
what can I use in order to keep this training performance progressing or at least maintaining that's going to improve how I feel from like a pursuit of progression within the gym relative to not having it in. And that's going to be the acute deployment of orals. Yeah. So you basically say you're using like a master on enanthate. We know it's probably another four weeks of cycling through this to where you're going to reach a peak a stable level. Mm. Well, hey, you might already be at your show by then. And then it's kind of late for what you want that job to do. Yep. So, so that's the pros to using the orals if they're fast deploying, which using something like the number of drugs you have to choose from when you are that close fast acting to go in would mm -hmm. be the rationale. Yep. Um, so we're left with the list of orals to choose from. And I think that's also where we hear a lot of talk around where we really want to like put each oral into its own box of like, this one makes you stronger. This one makes you hard or this one does X, Y, Z. And that leads to people just using all of them because they all think there's a separate purpose. Um, when really, like we said, the over encompassing for androgens for our purpose, now we're not powerlifters, is muscle retention. But regardless, they also have a strength component as well. To them, yeah. And that gym performance is what's going to be upholding tissue. But I think more so for us, it's like using something that's fast acting to get in. Absolutely. So I guess the conversation goes to like, well, what's on how, the how do you, yeah, what's on the table for all these? Yeah, I think. Initially, the conversation that, that gets presented to me is like Anavar, Winstraw, Halotestin. And like, where are those three on the table? I do occasionally see Anadrol kind of pulled in a bit earlier than just the peaking process. Like I've had a couple that have asked the question, like based on work with other coaches, like three weeks out using Anadrol kind of all the way through in. Um, but I think most of the time you're probably coming across Anavar, Winstraw or Halo is like that six to three week out potential deployment. And then the question you have to ask is like, again, kind of like you pointed out, what is our best option to create the outcome with the least amount of detriment, but also kind of take the boxes with that acute performance setting. Um, and to be honest, I have a tendency, and this is just a personal preference, but I have a tendency to lean towards Innovar, but we could potentially make an argument for all three, in my opinion. At the same time? Yep. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no, Jesus Got Christ, you, no. No, all, <laughs> potentially make an argument for all three by themselves. Yeah. And honestly, if, you, if you've been competing enough, like, ro rotate through each three, yeah, you know, to, to see which one that you do get along with more. Because I've had people that say, like, Winstraw really did it for me. Um, and I, maybe you have another coach that has a bias towards something that they prefer, and that's just, in general, what they keep giving out. Mm. I think that's where you lead to a lot of like the cycle design that you see. It's usually preferential bias from what the coaches just uses themselves. So to see what someone else gets along with or use that feedback could be a tool. But on, on paper, relatively, all these are similar in what they're doing. Because yep. we're, you know, whether it's Halo, Ma Ma um, Winstrol, or Anavar, they're all non aromatizing, uh, you know, DHT derivatives or testosterone derivative in, in some of these cases. But relative, they're, they're bringing the, kind of like the same thing to the table yep. yep, and what they can do. Now, all have been deployed clinically, so they all have some application in clinical setting. The one that's still used today is oxandrolone, and potentially it would could be the most benign in, in liver toxicity. Mm -hmm. And so, that I mean, that could be the starting point around that. But again, I, I don't think it's a rationale to be using all of them or deploying them on top and i think that where that happens is when you see them being stapled as these will make you hard yeah and well, we, we could hit on that i mean how would they make you hard that's the question right okay it's a hardener how does that work and the main route through that would have to be offsetting estrogen yeah estrogen with raising up your androgen load and by that point of a prep Usually that's already in place. You already have such a high peak androgen load. You're already using a, a lot of non-aromatizing compounds. So really this isn't your root issue. And if we want to talk about estrogen's not the main thing causing water retention. Yep. It's one of the inputs. It's, it raises renin angiotensin aldosterone. That's the main cause. But so do your androgens, whether they're non-aromatizing or not. So 
estrin is not the only variable that would be in play there, which kind of removes that rationale of deploying Halo to make you hard, yep. to raise up the engine load, because it's already been done. And that's why we look at our Telmasarin podcast around why you would use an ARB to modulate the, the angiotensin path to control water modulation over using an androgen. That's the more direct um, compound to use over an oral. But that's like the estrogen box. Like how else might these things work? And we already talked about aldosterone and estrogen within that. The other one would be cortisol. Yep. Which you are accumulating fatigue across a prep and cortisol levels are rising. Cortisol directly acts on the mineral corticoid receptor and it's in greater abundance than aldosterone as well. So we, you mean you see people that freak out, you know, one day out and they're holding water. Like, how does that work? Well, that's it. It's, it's cortisol driven. So would an androgen be the best tool to lower cortisol? And they have an influence on it. Uh, but the main thing during a peak week is not an androgen yep. for that purpose. Yep. I think that there's a client psychology component to that needs to be considered when you, you you kind of walk through the needs analysis of like why we're deploying these compounds and there are people who are going to have some sort of attachment because they've had previous experience of using one versus the other yeah. where potentially that conversation of talking to them and understanding that's their attachment and if it's like an acceptable use like potentially leaning towards that use like I have a prep right now who he's kind of getting to that back into prep. I think he's like four and a half weeks out, five weeks. And I had a conversation with him. I was like, Hey, like from a performance retention standpoint, I'm pushing you pretty hard. It's like, these are what's on the table. And I think that this would be kind of the best route to go. It's like, I'll be honest, man. Like I've had a lot of you, he was telling me this, a lot of windstraw use in the past, seen massive improvements within like a gym performance setting. It's like, okay, well, if you have that history, then you trust that client and that perspective, and that's the direction that you go, as long as it's not an egregious deployment. Psychologically. To manage that client. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a great point. I think even then, when you have that client, too, that has used the multiple orals in the past, the issue becomes, like, the long duration. Use. Use. So f for that idea... I mean, you could deploy that the last six days before a show. So if they had been using Anavar, like, hey, Halo, I, I, you know, this in place made this impact on my physique. Like, all right, well, let's just not run it for four weeks out, all of them. Yeah. The last few days of the show is enough to deploy those. Um, again, I, that would probably be more of the psychological aspect. And also, is it going to bring a harm to the physique? Yeah, I mean, and that's, I guess that's the question to ask, right? I think from my perspective, I would just not want new inputs six mm. days out. And that would be my thing. Um, I typically, if the conversation is the attachment to multiple at the same time, I walk them through why we wouldn't do the whole gamut and be like, hey, like we could potentially just use one for performance retention and this is kind of what's on the table. And then we, we find a place to settle. I think that's, that is a good point. So that might be in their mind. And then once you get to... Okay, peak week has arrived. You look like the Skeletor on the table, <laughs> right? Hey, could you walk on stage like this? You're like, yeah, this is the best I've ever looked. It's like, okay, okay, do you think we need anything else then? Like, well, I've already let my best. It's like, yeah, let's roll. <laughs> exactly. You know? So I think at that point, you could try to build the logic and let them come to that answer Yeah. Uh, versus kind of catering into that. Yeah, results speak, right? And I yeah. think when... I, I love talking the mechanistic stuff. I can talk about it for days, but we have to combine that with how we're coaching these athletes. You know, psychologically, we're not managing these athletes to a point where they are getting to their best. We may need to take a step back and look at like what are the coaching metrics that are happening that are not leading these people to their best. And I think sometimes it's just a simple conversation of, hey, this is what's on the table. Do you have any previous history or psychological preference to these? And if you only present the options that you're comfortable with using because you know they fit within the potential logical deployment, then it's like both client and coach are happy, even if it's not your preferred. Mm, yeah. And uh, except that, I mean, that other brings some other ones. We didn't even mention a couple other ones. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Um, I mean, Provirone. Oh, yeah. Is used relatively frequently mm -hmm. as the hardener. Yeah. It is, it is like, that's the coined one that I, I hear about. And... 
uh, and I've used it as well and, and deployed it. I've deployed it without it. And at least anecdotally, it doesn't bring much more than I've used just a single agent for. But it's, it's basically pure DHT. Yeah. So with that being said, you don't have the changes in the compound like the other DHT derivatives to drive a lot of anabolic processes. Like it's not that anabolic in muscle tissue. So you're just raising your DHT load, which has more potential just to, still for all the androgen side effects, but without anabolism. It's like, man, why don't you just use a DHT derivative that brings that Anabolism that has anabolism. Too. Now, those aren't as strong of, of DHTs. But nonetheless, it gets back to what we just talked about. How does it make you hard? And the mechanisms that you're usually, if you were to be retaining some type of water or have more body fat to lose, it's still not the main route to go through to accomplish that job. Exactly. So provirone has been the least likely one to be utilized. And, and even with that being said, like some people are like, oh, well, it makes all your other androgens more potent, right? By lowering sex hormone binding globulin. SHBG. But but once you raise your androgen load you're up, already getting that SHBG your SHBG is already smashed. Yeah. So that's already in place. And you already have enough androgens that are also offsetting estrogen. So it just doesn't have as much application. Um, off season is another conversation, but at least within what we're doing here for prep. Yeah. Not, not so much. Yeah, and I think there's still a couple that I think I come across quite frequently. Um, Anadrol slash Superdrol, like the last yeah. seven to ten days, um, especially within the loading perimeter. I know it's something that you with quite a bit. We could potentially map out the potential logic there. Yeah, at least with, with Anadrol, it can bring some water, um, and that's potential its action on the estrogen receptor. Mm -hmm. However, if you are skinned out, like we had mentioned, even an input on the estrogen receptor, that's not the main mechanism for causing water retention. And if someone's peeled, it could potentially, it's maybe through like its ability to improve like glycogen storage yep. or insulin sensitivity, like with what estrogen does. Again, that's kind of maybe a good guess on how that works. <laughs> but it's also pretty liver toxic. So, to justify using it really far out doesn't make sense as it might blur your assessment as, as a coach mm -hmm. and say like, oh, I need to stay full. Well, just staying full by holding water doesn't mean you're like retaining any muscle. So yep. when it would be make sense would be potentially the last few days. And I, I've used it in this setting. And anecdotally, clients will like take this pre-workout and they're ex exploding pump full, right? Yep. Now... How much can I pull from that by just loading someone with carbs? It, it's, it was pretty close, honestly, because I've used it with and without on the same clients. I was gonna say. And it wasn't, it wasn't drastically different. Yeah. Was it, did it harm the physique? No. Um, psychologically, it kind of had a benefit for the client, and they, they, they said they noticed it. But if you're going to use something like that, again, the last three days of the show, two hours before training, two hours before stage, that would be its application. But I would just say, make sure the person's like skin peeled to the bone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then other compounds around that would be super draw. Yeah. And I've, I've done this myself because I just need to uh, explore it. And super draw is uh, methylated masteron, mm -hmm. non-aromatizing, heavily liver toxic. Which, when I did use it say, only for data four data. days and pulled my labs a couple days after the show, I'm like, man, it was really impactful for my lipids and liver enzymes. And it brought absolutely nothing to my physique. Because <laughs> I, my past like competition year, every show I rotated to a different oral mm -hmm. to see like these effects um, individually. And it, it did nothing different, you know? So I think people like it because it, it does bring like the strength component. Again, not the application what we need the last mm. few days for our show for, for physique. So for the toxicity and, and what it brings, I, I still don't have the rationale for, for super draw. No. And I, it's funny you brought up a comment on the anadrol just to circle back. I've actually found that if I, if I just have someone early, ready early enough that I can start peak week, not seven days out, I can start at like 10 to 12. 
I haven't needed it to end draw yeah. at all from a fullness perspective because I can go through the deload process and then I can just use food and sodium and fluid to manipulate the fullness as needed. Yeah, no, I, I agree there. So you're still kind of left with like, hey, use one oral and that what's going to do a lot of its job. Yeah. If it's needed, don't think you have to use an oral either. I've had press where I haven't uh, used it The other all. like ones that don't, uh, one that definitely doesn't have the application would be, you know, Diana Ball. Yeah, no, you, no. you would be, uh, Diana Ball's idea was to be a, a TRT oral replacement. So it does cause a, a mess of water retention. And zero application for anyone, I think, bodybuilding. Uh, other, other one being uh, Tarina Ball, uh, which is basically a non-aromatizing D-ball. You're like, oh, well, that would make sense then. Um, issue with Tarina Ball is, is access and trusting the source. Like on paper, it seems like that would be a good option. Yep. Uh, less information on it being deployed in, in, in the literature yep. comparatively to, I'd say, like Anavar. So that's still like what I would lean into. Um, and I think that covers it. I think potentially you could just map out like the, the change in logic across the last 12 weeks is, you know, if you're looking at your physique 12, 13 weeks out and you feel like you're not where you need to be at that point, I'm, I'm going towards fat loss via lipolytic agents and yeah. cardiovascular activity and food and that kind of stuff no application for an oral deployment at that range. If we're looking at where we're at from a physique perspective at six, six-ish six weeks out, maybe you've got to step on the gas pedal a bit harder than you wanted to. And so in order to retain that performance, yeah. you you see the need, I'm, I'm full bore going for it because um, I think that the the direction that you go with that oral deployment needs to be, like we've mentioned, like specific to the need at hand. And then the last piece would be, can we do an oral deployment that's going to influence the acute look within the setting of seven to 10 days pre-show? And I think the only one that could potentially have a uh, deployment there would be Anadrol. But again, if I've, I'm at the point right now where I've seen it, seen it make a visual change, but if I just ran the prep where I can start the peak week far enough out, I'm not needing it at all. And so that's kind of like the three sections where like I've come across it the most is like maybe not a full understanding and deploying like, oh, I'm behind it 13 weeks out. And so they're just throwing something at it because they don't really know what they're doing. Well, let's look at what we could potentially actually be using to solve the root problem. And it's just fat loss, like the rate of fat loss is yeah. not there. And then at that six weeks out mark, like if you're rolling prep through and like performance in the gym is holding extremely well and your rate of loss is perfect, maybe you're a little bit ahead, that need may not be there. And there's a lot of preps where that's the case. And so it doesn't mean because you're six weeks out, you deploy it. And that's the question you have to answer. I think that's the most pivotal question to answer is what does the prep look like coming to that last piece? Is the potential for performance detriment there? And then going through through that. Yeah, no, that's a good summarization. <laughs> yeah. And just to touch before... We close it out because um, the same thought process still applies to your your females uh, that yeah. you're, you're coaching, Ex with the exception that there's a much smaller pool of oral, oral options. options yeah. um, but if you understand the basis of what we just talked about, that these agents aren't hardeners, that removes a lot of a lot of those other tools that you usually see that are not appropriate in females, like Provirone. I see that very inappropriate for female deployment mm. and at the end of prep for a female same issues you're already controlling water with other variables estrogen is not going to be the root issue if you're controlling a lot of the main drivers of water retention and so beyond that point is like how much more do they need to retain tissue and it's really come down to almost only solely oxandrolone as the other options i see way too problematic for, for females um but that's the, the little piece on females. But, you know, the, the quick points here would be early on in prep, focus on pulling off body fat. That's why you're not hard yet. Mm. Control water using like something like an ARB for someone being enhanced. That's going to remove that variable for accurate assessment. Use what you need, need to utilize for muscle retention as you get into prep. And finally, 
w- within the peak week setting, you know, managing fatigue well to remove cortisol from something that's water retentive as well. Through those four aspects, you should be able to have good rationale and bring someone in hard and not having to have inappropriate deployment and using your orals wrong. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Let us know if you're on YouTube, have any questions below. We'll answer them for you. Talk to you next time.